So today I'm continuing our series on what justice looks like. It's one thing to say we're committed to social justice, and another thing to figure out what that means in practice, in our day-to-day lives. What does justice look like, and how do we keep a strong connection between social justice and our spirituality? These are ongoing faith questions. Last week we looked at food, and this week we'll meditate on clothing, literally and figuratively. I'd like to begin with the sung prayer. Um, You will probably know the song, so feel free to sing with me. Let us pray. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Amen. So on our drive up here from Morrill Park to Hamden, we go up Fulton Street, which is one of the corridors in the city made famous by The Corner, the show that The Wire is based off of. And I like traveling on it because it's usually not very busy. Uh, But there are a lot of empty and boarded up houses on what seems like should be a thriving thoroughfare. And for a few weeks, when I first started taking this road, I saw police lights flashing somewhere along like a two to three mile stretch just about every time I went up it. Uh, So I'm guessing that it's a difficult place to live. And I will admit that I've never actually stopped to get out and look around. But there are signs, too, of people trying to work together to fight against the crime and the poverty, including what looks like a little community garden where there's a sign on the fence that says, You respect me, and I'll respect you. And up the street, there's another sign that says, Respect is free, but disrespect is costly. Am I quoting that right? Does it say that? Disrespect is costly? Okay, some other folks have seen it. Okay. Anyway, that's the sentiment. And the goal, I'm sure, is to encourage the young and disadvantaged folks in the neighborhood to respect each other and to not get into fights that can lead to violence and can lead to death. So I respect the effort. And the pictures on the signs and the community gardens certainly brighten up the neighborhood. But I have to disagree with the one that says that respect is free. Because while in a way, of course, our respectful behavior toward one another is always free, somehow it seems like respect is frequently in short supply. Because somehow it does seem costly to us, especially when it comes to respecting people who are struggling and in poverty. Help that comes without respect, without listening, and with too much focus on the giver and not enough on the receiver is, in fact, no help at all. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, lots of people went to their closets and pulled out things they didn't want to send to the people dealing with the after effects of the storm. The problem with this is that, while it's well-intentioned, piles and piles of clothes ended up just dumped on the side of the road, collecting mold and animal pests and making life worse and not better for the disaster victims. The impulse to help is good, but it doesn't take into account what's actually needed. So we actually have some visuals here if you want to. So this is Hurricane Katrina. All these clothes are basically kind of wasted. And then there's another one from the tsunami, which was 2004. And this is like seven months later. They just kind of like took the clothes and dumped them on the beach. And then they're useless. Okay, so we can go up to the top one here. The guy eating. Yeah, thank you. Um, And in a similar way, uh, Heather and I invited some folks we knew to help us uh, with Hurricane Katrina, put together hygiene kits for the hurricane victims, which is very similar to what we're doing here with our flood buckets, except we're more ambitious to do flood buckets. <laughs> and anyway, and one of the items on the list was either you need to get a metal nail file or a nail clipper, but one or two people brought emery boards, which the list specifically said not to bring. So I know it sounds picky, actually. I've, I hear myself being picky right now. But the people who put those lists together deal with disaster victims every day, and they know what works and what's going to be helpful. So the upshot was that um, we had to go out later and get a bunch of metal nail files. I think that's what we did. And then we had emery boards for, like, forever, because, you know, where do you return them to? Anyway, but the point is that respect for the person on the receiving end means being careful to get them what they actually need. 
So one more story in this vein. I was talking to a pastor about a local food shelf that his neighborhood's churches work together to stock. And the volunteers pack the bags, which means that the people who pick up the bags and use the food don't actually get to choose what food they're going to eat. Not every food shelf does it that way. Some places let people effectively shop for themselves and pack their own bag. But at this particular one, people get what they get. And the folks organizing feel it, it feel like if you're hungry enough to ask for food, then you should just take what you can get. And then one family came, uh, the, well, there was one family who came once a month and they got their bag of food. But at the end of about a year, they came back to the food shelf with a bag full of cans, all of them canned peas. We're moving, the mom said, and we don't like peas. Right? So they're like, all right, I guess you don't need peas. Do you like peas? Well, too bad you didn't get those peas. So what would it look like to do things differently? Let's talk about housekeepers. At Walt Disney World, they are obsessive about hospitality. When we, we went there one time and we joked that there was like little animals that would show us to our room. They were so hospitable. And they make sure, uh, I guess that's, that maybe is a you had to be there joke. I apologize. Anyway, um, it was, I'm sorry, Heather's right. Okay, so they make sure, but okay, but they are obsessive about hospitality. And you notice it everywhere. And they make sure to hire talented staff who are good at hospitality. And that extends to the housekeepers. So the management at Disney World did a study to see how their best housekeepers did their work. And how did the people who got the most compliments and the least complaints behave when it came to making up a room? As it turns out, the last thing their most talented housekeepers did was to lie down on the bed. Right? Not what you expect, right? You're like, why would you do that? At least that was my response. But what they're doing is they're lying down on the bed to see what the room looks like from the perspective of the person who's going to sleep there. It wasn't just about getting all the tasks done, toilet, sink, vacuum bed. The reward of the work for these talented employees was about helping a person feel welcome about their whole experience. So in our scripture today, Christ puts himself in the place of those most in need. He is the one who is hungry. He is the one who is cold. He is the one who is in need and thirsty and alone. And when we serve those in need, we serve Christ. So we should probably try to do a good job with it. You know. What does it look like when we live this out? In some ways, very little is different. It's possible to treat people respectfully or not and take just about the same exact actions. But on the other hand, everything is different. None of us is Jesus. None of us by ourselves can change another person's life or a community's life just with our own bare effort. What really matters is the relationship. Are we building relationships in the way that we serve others? Are we making help available in a way that builds up the person receiving it? Are we strengthening the community that we're serving rather than taking away its power? So this week, the people of Maryland voted yes on gay marriage. And while this is something that the gay community wanted and needed, ultimately it wasn't something that we could make happen all by ourselves. Straight allies advocating, straight people voting made the difference. And I, for one, am grateful for the solidarity. And in a way, it's a reminder, too, that we're all in this together. That the kingdom of God doesn't come because some people do something, but because all of us together receive God's blessing in our lives. So my prayer is that the Spirit of Christ will be with us, as we serve, and that we will see Christ in the faces of the people that we meet. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's have some time for silence, and then we'll have some community conversation about this question, is it ever hard for you to accept help?